We are here at a wonderful De Hoya Golf Club for a Coaching Mastery Summit, both of you and um, the heart of that, uh, I always ask what, what's the mission, what we are doing here, why, why are we meeting with such a bunch of good coaches here and I think the, the heart about all that is about how to learn, how to learn golf. And there are some connections uh, from years ago where we met first. Mm -hmm. uh, a name we already remember is Fred Shoemaker. Uh, yeah. That knit us everything, I think, uh, together. I think that was in Spain uh, when we met. Yeah, we met, uh, <coughs> looked at that, 2017, March. Yeah, uh, that's in right. In Spain. Yeah, uh, I remember. We were, we were both participants in yeah. one of the courses. Yeah. And you met, I think, Fred. 15 years, 20 years ago, or what? 1997 or 8? 1997, so last century. So 25 years ago. Yeah. What was the thing that really fascinated you? I, I, I saw a video about you, what's, what's about instinctive golf coaching, and I think Fred Schumacher was one of the turning points or key things, or how do you describe that? Yeah, he was a, a turning point in my, my coaching career. Why? It was pure chance, because I picked up a book at uh, the golf show in, in Florida, and it was called Extraordinary Golf, which I, I thought was a, an interesting uh, title. Um, read the book on the way home in the flight, which is totally unusual for me, because I'm a bit dyslexic, so I don't read well, but I read that book, it captivated me. Um, went straight to see him and about two months later in California. And it, I suppose it resonates with what we do here. You know, a huge part of the experience of, of being at Fred's school was the people that were at the school, as much as Fred. Mm -hmm. There was an incredible group of people, powerful, powerful experience. Mm -hmm. But Fred, um, he would never answer a question with anything other than a question, which, which, <laughs> which was frustrating but fascinating. He... He, he was like this wise man who I, you, know, you could sit and listen to. You know, those people in life we can quite happily just listen to. And he was an incredibly competent player, which was really impressive. It was like he was walking his talk and playing at an incredibly high level. And mm. all of that mix was very alluring to me. And I was in a dark place with my own coaching and my own game, so... I felt it was it was the time to explore something new. However, going down that avenue was not a, a linear experience. It was definitely like this to begin with because it was quite a um, it was quite a different approach to what I had done from most of my life up to then. But yeah, he was very influential. Very yeah, influential. yeah that, that, same for me. Yeah, I was there quite quite often, a few few times, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> whatever. In that one, and I made a uh, talk and interview, whatever, with Fred, that's also my YouTube channel, um, five years ago in Norway. Uh, and that was his 65th birthday. And one of his statements were, and now, Martin, I might fulfill my target. I'm shooting lower scores than my ages. <laughs> and that's incredible. Uh, that's age 65, and he's so dedicated. Uh, each and every day, I think he's doing training, coaching, working on a swing, experiencing, exploring things, yeah. and that's very inspiring. Yeah. Do you remember, it's not, usually it was a coaching seminar you attended with him? Yeah. That once a year he's doing that, I think? Yeah, possibly at that time, I can't remember, but it was a, I, I because your stupid ego, I'm thinking, well, I'll be attending a coach's or a professional's. Yes. Seminar, but he mm -hmm. said, you know, everybody's lumped together. So yeah. you were yeah. where, where, there with people who hadn't played. Mm -hmm. You were there with amateur champions, senior amateur champion was there, professionals, coaches, and I think that added to the experience. So yeah, it was unique. It was yeah. very unique. Yeah. It's a bit like, fortunately, what we've got here. Every day of all sorts of levels, and mm -hmm. some not professional coaches, and some professional coaches, and players, and so, yeah, wide and varied. Nice. Yeah, and you met Fred first time when you were there in Spain? I did, that was the first time, yeah, and really I read the book as well, which I absolutely loved and loved the putting book also, Extraordinary yeah, Putting. It's not about putting, it's about... Yeah, it's about everything. Experience, almost. learning, whatever, yeah. you know, I think that's... that's yeah. yeah, 
the title is not mis it's a bit misleading. I, I yeah. Think. yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, more than more than just putting. Um, yeah. But I, re I really enjoy both books. Lo loved the putting book, and Kendall always spoke so highly of Fred uh, that it was just a matter of time. Really, I knew I had to go and uh, uh, meet him at some point, and had the chance to do it a few years ago, yeah. and it was. It was fantastic. I mean, the the sessions outside were great, uh, but for me, the the sessions we had indoors. Yeah. You remember, you know, all around the square table and just having discussions about. Yeah, he has this scrapbook there with with all the things he's written yeah. down and telling that one work on a new book, I guess. Yeah. That was the start, yeah. or more than a start, and then yeah. you know, that, that was evolving. Yeah. Yeah. More, seeing that quite interesting. Yeah, and I how, remember that well. Yeah, and how do you meet then? How do you, I'll let, I'll let how do you come together? Now you. Let <laughs> Stephen tell that story. <laughs> Yeah, it's an interesting one because um, I so I grew up in Glasgow. Very briefly, played full time golf, like many people have. Um, failed at that, you know, pretty well, <laughs> as as many people have as well. <laughs> moved yeah. moved into coaching in two thousand and three, um, and kind of jumped fully from playing to coaching almost from one day to the next. Mm -hmm. So from practicing seven eight hours a day to stopping completely and made the decision I wanted to be, you know, a coach and be a good coach. So then suddenly became more aware of what other coaches were doing and had a lot of failings as a player. So I was looking for trying to understand why that happened. And then immediately in my kind of awareness became the, the stuff that Kendall was doing and mm -hmm. talking about things I had never considered before. Um, and we really only got to know each other from about 2003 onwards. But the interesting thing is we probably live about half a mile apart in the same town in Glasgow, but we never okay. we never knew each other mm -hmm. while I was living in Glasgow. So literally, he lived down the road, but it was only when I moved down to the south of England did I give up playing, and then it was like, oh, Kendall, that's the madman that lives up in uh, Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> so you know him before as, as, as the madman? <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. In a nice way, of course. Yeah, in all kinds of ways. Yeah, yeah. So it's, so it's a weird one. So I moved 500 miles away yeah. and then got to know Kendall, who lived round the corner from me, mm -hmm. from where I lived. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, a madman in the nicest sense, but it's been one yeah, of the of biggest influences in, in my coaching, for sure, yeah. over the and, years. And then, then how do you meet then? So how do you know his name or how do you get connected? So I think you, you I just hear from a madman, take up the phone and say, hi, madman, I want to take, <laughs> learn something about coaching. madman in golf. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Of course. So top of the Google list of madmen. Yeah. I think it was a, a CPD seminar at the Belfry mm -hmm. that Kendall was running on Instinctive Golf and I lived just a few hours away and I was keen to learn and get better as a coach, so um, I, I attended that seminar. And yeah, he's not been able to get rid of me since. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but then something has to happen on that seminar that really, yeah, uh, yeah influenced you or mm. whatever resonates with you or whatever. Yeah. What, what was that? So yeah, and it certainly did. I mean, I think it, it made me question a lot of the things I I had taken a particular journey trying to get to get better as a player. Um, mm. A lot of time, a lot of effort, but not a huge amount of return, I would say. It's a mm -hmm. similar story to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, I think Ken Kendall made me think about things I'd never really considered, never really considered learning, exploration, hitting golf shots. It, my journey had been very mechanically driven. It was, it was all around, if I just find this really perfect golf swing, mm -hmm. I was going to have what I was looking for. Um, and that didn't really work out for me particularly well. So. All these things I hadn't really thought about, Kendall was starting to explore and talk about, and that was just very interesting to me. So. Yeah, that, that's something like my journey. I, I first started when, when I was studying golf, uh, also with 38, hitting the first shot. Oh, really? 38? Um, 38, yeah. Wow. First time with a golf club, and then getting yeah hooked up. And it, it, it never gets less, it even gets more. Yeah. Uh, the longer I'm doing that, even coaching, and I, even if I'm a fitting business. But uh, my, my first company name I, I, in the market was a perfect swing. Right. But I changed that now to Martin Stetcher Golf right. <laughs> because of my person. But after we've done things with, with Fred and with you, and I was at 2018 in Woodall's Law Golf Club with, with both of you. And yeah. It was my first summit I've done, was participated with you both. Yes, and yeah. so there's no perfect golf swing. And even mm -hmm. if I'm 
using all tech available on the planet with 3D system and things like that, but then I have some tour pros, long drivers, amateurs, whatever in there. Why is that so different from person to person, from shot to shot? Mm -hmm. And how can we learn to do something with a golf ball? How can, can we get into something that people want to have something, they want to own something and own the shot and now have my golf swing? No, that never will happen, but, but what's, what's necessary for that, in, in, in your opinion? From a learning perspective, and I think that's more about the heart of what instinctive golf coaching is. But, but maybe, you, of course, <coughs> you're the expert. <laughs> um, yeah, th it was learning, that was the, that was the word, um, Martin. That to me, my experience in golf was all about teaching, being taught, being told. And then of course I, I bought into that, and then you search out information and more information and more books, and so on and so forth. And then of course along come the the Faldos of the world and the Ledbetter era, and then you get hooked on that because of success. You think I want some of that. So yeah, I ended up in a mire of information, information overload, and the more I knew, the less I could do personally. So that was a big, big alarm bell. Thinking this. Cannot be right. And I, I remember the odd lessons in 1997 when I was at a real low and I thought, I'm coaching these lovely people. What has made me hate this game at this point? And I thought, that that's just can't be right. It was like fraudulent. I always felt, I thought, you're a fraud. You know, so. And then Fred came along, it must be meant to be, and that that was why it resonated so much. Maybe it wasn't just the Fred, it was just something new, but it was Fred, it was about the, the art of the possible is a great subtitle to his book, and yep. I thought, that's what it is, that we've got to be capable of more. And It has not been linear, Martin. Since that day I met him and I thought, well, this is it, but it's not like that. It's, been a, it's still been a, a very rocky road but a different rocky road, a learning rocky road, trying to replace all the conditioning that I had over 20 years of doing something else. And, and then you bump into people like yourself. And I can't believe what you said there, that's 15 years since we met. 15 years, is, that's incredible. Um, yeah, and then you be, and you do need, I think, support. And the, the game of golf is a solitary game and I'm an only child, so my life is spent basically on my own. And, Golf was perfect for that, being a moan. Yeah. I was happy in moan. Mm -hmm. But then you do need support to get somebody who's like-minded and driven and driving in the same direction. That was key, and of course that led, I think that led to the friendship. Apart from, apart from the, the, it was just a friendship anyway. There was lots of reasons why we were friends, apart from the fact he's just a fellow Glaswegian and, a, and quite a nice guy, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> It was I've the, recorded that so it, it indeed, never, he never normally yeah. says that. But it was the <laughs> Yeah, you know, I don't need to tell you any more about Stephen Orr, but the drive that he has to master the the coaching of the game particularly is astonishing. There is nobody I have met I know he's sitting in the room with me, but there is nobody I've met like Stephen Orr. And the respect I have for him, and it's nice to hear him what he's saying about me, but the respect I have for that is astonishing because that takes incredible guts and courage and time and effort and he, he does all of that to then be where he is a you know a, a doctor a master professional the youngest master professional ever in PGA history as as far as I know maybe not but yeah I think he is um, and a bit like Fred incredibly talented golfer his ability mm -hmm. to put the club with the ball and solve the problem I think if he if he couldn't do that, it would be a different. But that's like the cream on the top of the cake. I think all this stuff to then have this guy who can do what he can with the golf club, and we witnessed it yesterday. Didn't we? Again, <laughs> once again, it's not luck. We know it's not no. luck. It's every year he does it, doesn't he? So <laughs> there we go. Yeah, you're on the golf course, so a different story. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, that's always putting it a bit down, but. I uh, even have the same same feeling like, like connection uh, that that you're so 
um, yeah, addicted to golf and golf mm. knowledge and golf learning golf and, and I think now it's golf coaching yeah and yeah, also yeah. the science behind that mm. that that's make you yeah, you make you a, a doctor in that one now we have always uh, through all this ah oh, doctor 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's new so <laughs> congratulations for everyone who didn't know that uh, of course and um, I think you never worked <laughs> were at universities that right or how do you how do you how, how was your way to that and and what, what really drives you, um, I think that's more at the heart. But yeah. the title and, and the work is one thing, but mm -hmm. no one does that for years without yeah. inner specific motivation yes. and drive to do that. It takes mm -hmm. so much, uh, yeah, uh, even having, if you cannot do anything. So here, when you decide mm -hmm. to go that road, I think you have to stop some other. Mm -hmm. but, but, but what, what's yeah. driving you? Well, I mean, I, I'm not really sure to be honest, um, but yeah, I didn't, um, I didn't go to university when I left school. I didn't set foot in a university till I was 35, mm -hmm. um, and it's just that I think what came out once I stopped playing, you know, in my mid 20s was just a passion for learning. Mm -hmm. It was probably there in my late teens. Actually, I was always reading books, psychology books. Probably you were someone like that as well, mm -hmm. you know, reading, studying. Um, so when I had time when I wasn't playing, I just was always a reader, always studying, always trying to understand how to do better at golf. And then, you know, I gradually moved into the academic world. Um, had an opportunity to do a postgrad diploma in mm -hmm. sports coaching in, mm -hmm. when I was 35. And I just stayed at university for 11 years, basically. <laughs> yeah. um, did a master's and then just continued on and did a doctorate in elite performance and the sort of field of study was skill acquisition. Again, the thing that Kendall and I are, mm -hmm. are very interested in is, um, so I'm really interested in elite players because I tend to, you know, coach squads, you know, good up and coming players and um, interested in learning and skill development. So my, my research was in, was in that area. And what the difference between a skill, you always use that word and getting a good swing or whatever. Mm -hmm. So what's, what's the difference between that? Well, I mean that's a that's a big uh, big question. I mean, to me, a technique is, you know, is just how somebody moves the club. That's mm -hmm. the way you could describe their technique. Mm -hmm. um, and the skill is, you know, what they can do as they move the club. So the number of shots that they can hit when they have to hit them mm -hmm. in different environments. So that would be the application of the technique becomes the skill. What can they do with their technique? Mm -hmm. You know, in different situations and different circumstances. So context different contexts uh -huh. there's, there's a lot of golfers who have what you might call quite good technique based on what you see on the driving range but potentially lacking in skill when it actually comes to performing you know so that's the the difference i would make between the two yeah but that's a different thing than just being the psychologist and being thinking positive or getting mm. concentrated it's just mm. another thing has to be learned to do the transfer from i feel whatever sounds swing for one thing to to solve problems, I think so. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah, psychology would be about, to me, you know, that the difference between psychology and, say, motor learning is psychology is about improving performance with what somebody already has. Skill acquisition is more around all of the factors that influence learning and motor behavior. So, attentional focus, uh, practice design, um, how we utilize feedback, all of the things that we know that have an influence on how somebody learns a movement pattern and retains it and transfers it into different environments. So that's where there would be a, a kind of a difference between psychology and say motor learning. Mm. And that's what, what you're famous for, for the golf hammer, <laughs> things like that. Um, but it, it, it's not the tool I think that makes the difference, it's the approach. We, we can, I think we can take a lot of different things to do kind of <laughs> different approach to that one. Um, and, and where do you hook up? What, what's your, yeah, what's at the heart of your instinctive golf coaching? Definitely skill. Um, to be the game, most sports are all about skill. Obviously we have to perform, but we're trying to perform skills. So when I looked at the way I'd, I'd learned the game, the way I was coaching the game, that was, my belief was if we get this right, we'll develop the skill. Uh -huh. And this was getting the basics right and getting a golf swing that looked technically as if it was adept. 
but that, that wasn't my story. I had a golf swing that people might say, oh, you have such a nice swing, Kendall. And I, I'm standing over the ball and I don't know where it's going. And that, it was quite annoying when people said that. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be near people that would tell me how nice the swing was because I did not, it felt, I couldn't produce the shots I wanted to. So I knew that the, there was a fundamental flaw in coaching from that standpoint that said, if we can get the technique right, a skill will emerge. Well, actually, we would suggest the opposite is true. If we can start to develop skills and learn to solve problems with these tools, a, a technique will emerge, basics will emerge. So it's, mm -hmm. we call it reverse engineering. So we're always trying to work back the way from the shot we're trying to hit, and how the club needs to be delivered, and a position that allows us to do that, and doing it, and rehearsing, and exploring, and, and discovering it, and owning it, and having it as a learned skill. And at that point, it tends not to be lost. It's, it's not a found and lost it mm -hmm. journey. It's more of, I have it, it's in here, and I can call upon it. And if it's not as good as I want it to be, I'm not in any panic to go and fix something. So it was definitely a reversal of how I'd coached for 20 years. Well, it's complete upside down thinking. Upside down. And um, uh, you tell it in a, this voice, this one, I like one, but that uh, should, you could, should take a lot of people. <laughs> Please think in a different way. Yeah. How do you learn other things? I asked a cook, uh, was, was, was it fitting with me? Um, and when they, they're using the knives to cutting onions, they're doing the ch -ch 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 yeah. I'm always fascinated with that. I'm asking how to do that. Well, uh, first, a few instructions just to protect your fingers. Yeah, yeah. Then I describe you just a basic technique. You have to cut it this one, this one, this one, this one, and then that. And then 1,000 onions. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and yeah. then it's about we have some using, and, and that the knife is not like can be this one, more like this one, and then, and then the specific techniques that it's different from from chef to chef yes yeah it's not the same it's the, but it solves the problem mm -hmm. the, I, yeah. the getting this ideal cut it whatever things to that one carrots <laughs> whatever they can do yeah. and an incredible tempo and even talking about that without yeah, yeah, yeah. losing the fingers or <laughs> whatever I, I need more than a thousand onions or whatever <laughs> to do that but 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 I think that that was also like uh, it's mind old it's so, so simple mm -hmm. Yeah. Go back, don't read books about using the knife with the angles and this one and that one. And does it start from the shoulders or from here or from there? Mm -hmm. Just use the tool yeah. you know, first. Yeah. And without having an, an, an idea how can I use the club, I ask a lot of players, do you have an idea what your club face is doing from here to there? 98% no idea. No. But I think that's the biggest, one of the biggest problems they have. They have no idea why I'm using what kind of motion. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's like <clears throat> you've got a problem and a solution, haven't you? And yeah. The problem usually is always what you start with. I mean, that's the thing that drives the solution. But in golf coaching, it's, I think for a long time it's been the other way around is we're just trying to give someone a solution that looks right in the hope that it solves the problem. So... It's coming back to trying to set a problem that somebody can then come up with a solution. But some of the times the challenge in golf is that you can't see the problem or the, the problem doesn't remain as clear as something, say, like hammering a nail into a wall. Everyone can see the problem for what that is. You know, Kendall talks a lot about, you know, hammering nails. But with golf, you know, you've got an angled face, a round ball, you're trying to hit it forward up in there. Sometimes that problem is not clear. Yeah. And that's where likes of the golf hammer, the golf nail that... Kendo uses are are great, and you know some of the other tools that just actually illuminate this is the problem that we're trying to solve, and that that kick starts things for a lot of people, I think. Yeah, I mean when you when you then think from a beginner, an intermediate, advanced, and professional, mm -hmm. is there a different approach in that, or is, is it or the same for you? Well, first of all, I think you make a great point, and it's something that should be reconfirmed, and that is. What we believe what we're doing is trying to align golf with everything else. Because it appears that golf has managed to align itself with nothing else. So, as you mentioned, all the amazing skills we've got as human beings has been learned in reverse to how golf has been coached. 
There were not. People have much more with me, I suppose, because it was difficult in the days of this mad guy who's trying to do this stuff. But I was battling with the fact that I learned to play all these other sports the other way around and I'm coaching the game that is my profession. But the only reason I did that was because that was how I was taught to teach by my well-meaning PGA. And, and I'm not blaming them in any way, but because they had to find a way of, of producing some kind of formula that would that we could use. And I think that's so important what you said there, Martin, that anyone who's listening to this realises that we're not trying to do anything other than realign us with everything else. How a mo yeah. particular motor skill, but beyond motor skills, you know, problems always drive solutions. So we have to start with the problem and back the way, and that's not how golf has ever been taught. So, However, going to your question about different standards, and it's been something that's been interesting this week at the summit, um, where we've kind of separated, looking at how the, we might help the entry level and golfers build a golf swing against Stephen, looking at perhaps how the established player might develop his game and develop his skills. And I think what's become a, very apparent is neither of those, as simple as we might make them, neither of those are easy. Mm -hmm. Because the established player has now built up this depth of habit that is now comfortable, is subconscious, but is maybe not as effective as it could be, and, and that's fine. And that then trying to evoke change and trying to develop a skill, which would seem as simple as if you just move the club like this, you'll be able to hit this different shot. That doesn't get transferred easily to someone who's running a deep, deep kind of habitual pattern that has the club moving ineffectively. And then we move to the beginner. For a lot of people, it's just a challenging game, isn't it? Because this is a strange looking tool and the ball's a long way away and the target's even further away. And so that end of the, uh, the market, the spectrum is tough. And then we're dealing with top players trying to evoke change and learn new skills is a different challenge, but equal as tough, perhaps even more difficult mm -hmm. because of the, the habit that's driving what they think they're doing in reality, they're not doing anything like that, and awareness is very poor. So, it's, yeah, both I think are very different, but in a, in a weird way, incredibly similar. Yeah, and then on top of that, there's a belief system. Yeah, and, and hopefully at the beginning, the belief systems are, are not there, they're trying to be developed, but in experienced players, they are deep rooted. Yeah, how to, what I have to, I have to learn in this way. It's the only way we can do that. That's yeah. the correct technique mm -hmm. because I believe in whatever kind of golf swing patterns and things and thoughts and schools and names with teachers and whatever on it. Um, that's yeah. the best and correct way that's right. to, to, to do that and, and even how to learn the belief system. We have to learn golf that way. I think it's very influential for, for all people. And when you challenge that, mm -hmm. It confuses everything. Uh, that's what upside down too. Not only that I'm doing it in a different way, yeah. but uh, yeah. it, 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 it takes them always back in the community around them who thinks, no, that's not good teaching. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have, a, have do, don't you have got all the information you need? Yep. And, and, and then I think that's your specific thing. You studied the last years, uh, how skills mm -hmm. are learned mm -hmm. and um, it, it was yesterday, like, uh, when you tell them how can we start with that, doing the movements without anything, and that one without the ball, maybe without playing, mm -hmm. and then the next stage, and the next stage, and the next stage, and uh, mm. it took not only a week or two. Mm -hmm. what, right. what do you think when, when someone plays a few years of golf, uh, is only able to slice the ball and wants to learn to, to draw the ball? Mm -hmm. what, what can be a concept or what steps are necessary and how long could that take? That's a question we always get. Asked, yeah. how long does it take for me to learn that? Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's a, it's a hard one to, to say, really. I mean, it depends on so many things. You know, how, what does the person bring to the table? Everybody brings something to the starting point that's different. Some people have got a lot of sports experience who can pick things up really quickly. Yeah. Some people yeah. less so. Some people are more committed and motivated to pushing on and developing their skills. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I don't think any skill is a... You might be able to, we were talking about this yesterday, you might be able to see someone change a ball flight quite quickly, but it doesn't mean that the skill is learned. Mm. So it's a, it's, it's a fairly long process of, of change for somebody to be able to do something without having to think too hard about how they're doing it. Um, mm. so Are there specific stages you need to have? Or in a specific order? What, what's your... Uh, idea about that yeah well, about well that. so I mean I, sh I shared some research yesterday around yeah. um, some work from Dave Collins and Howie Carson around mm -hmm. um, changing an established movement pattern so that would be somebody who has a way of moving the club that's ineffective and they want to change or tweak that technique um, and they talk about following some specific stages mm -hmm. so they get this what they call their 5a model mm -hmm. so that's uh, the first stage would be analysing, okay, what do I need to change? What's the time scales involved? Am, mm -hmm. am I prepared to commit the time to, to actually doing this? Second stage would be increasing awareness, so getting somebody to become aware of their movements. So rather than, you know, it would conflict a little bit with popular beliefs in golf coaching is you've just got to get someone hitting it better in the first hour, for example. That's a common thing you hear in golf yeah, coaching. Yeah. Um, and I can only stop if I have one, have one good shot. Yeah, 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 and I, I'm not really, I think Kendall's probably the same, I'm not convinced that's true or even hugely important in the first hour. I think mm -hmm. if somebody can become aware of what they're doing and can start to feel differences, they can understand the task that they're trying to solve, they're aware of what they're doing and can feel potentially some difference in how they're moving the club, I think that's a good start that, it, that leads the way for more long-lasting change. I don't think it's that difficult just to get someone hitting a different shot quite quickly, but you can do things, you can be very directive, you can move the club for the person and get them hitting the ball better, but really, in reality, they haven't learned anything. So you've got choices to make all the time. Um, yeah, and then... Yeah, so there's, so there's a few stages. So that first, increasing awareness, getting somebody more aware, rather yeah. than just running a pattern, more aware of what they're doing mm -hmm. right now then start to create some contrast mm -hmm. between old and new. Then you start to create the potential for change. And then um, what they call re-automate, which is then start to try and get that new movement pattern running more subconsciously. So using things like external cues, rhythm cues, so trying to get the person to do things more um, subconsciously. And then subjecting that new movement to a bit of pressure, which would be the final stage, the um, assurance mm -hmm. stage. Yeah. So it's a nice, really very, I think, helpful bit of research for coaches in terms of if they have to change technique, there's some guidance there as to how to do it, which we haven't really had in golf coaching mm -hmm. before some of that research came out. So we've kind of just not been getting guidance from, say, science, just kind of left our own devices in that regard. Yeah, when I come to you and say, I have this habit, I'm playing now for 18 years. Mm -hmm. How long do we have to work together, or how long have I to learn? Uh, I think most of the work is for me, <laughs> for the learner, yeah. and not for the coach. Yeah, I, think yeah, yeah. I have to learn everything. Uh, it's not easier to write on a paper and tell me, Martin, you have to A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and that's yeah. it, remember yeah. that. Yeah. And even if I wake you up at night, you can tell me the six points, then we <laughs> solve <Yeah>. the riddle. <laughs> I think it's more than more than change your like the five stages. Mm -hmm. uh, how long would it take and what kind of commitment uh, do I have to, to bring with me when, when I want to really change something well, like from slice to draw? Well, I mean, if we're talking specifically, specifically about the, their research, they're looking at like a three to four month process to yeah. actually create some change and a specific change. But, Some changes in yeah. three to four months. Yeah, mm -hmm. so a, a specific mm -hmm. movement, change mm -hmm. in the movement pattern. Yeah. Um, but the reality is it's a lifelong it's a lifelong journey, isn't it? Because it depends, you know, if somebody's trying to become as good a player as they can, there's always the next problem to solve and the next problem to solve and the next problem to learn. So Yeah, but I want continue. to just first maybe solve this one problem. Yeah. Um, of course, yeah. Uh, for me, it's natural if I started to solve one problem, I want to solve the next one. Um, yeah. always want to learn, learn, learn. Yeah. But when I want the one that the three to four months to that the changes start going into a bit more automatic thing. Yeah. That's and then the... half a year, nine months, one year, what do you think? Well you would look to to have seen 
the effect of, of the specific change that you were trying to make in, in, in somebody's technique. Yeah. And then there's lots of different ways that you could then coach that in those five stages. Mm -hmm. But those would just be logical stages to go through to, to try and create some change. But, you know, at, at the end of that, there's going to be more stuff to do. So you just drop back into that loop again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but in terms of a specific change, that would that that would be the time scales that they were they were Minimum talking about. Minimum three to four months, maybe yeah. a year. Yeah, depends. Yeah, that would be realistic time scales. Yeah. Yeah, and how often I have I to train daily, once a week, two times a week, ten minutes, an hour. Don't know. What, what, what yeah. Would, what would you suggest for me? Well. Um, the more the better, generally. I mean, there's <laughs> okay. a basic answer, but yeah. I think quality always over quantity. So, okay. mm -hmm. so you know, what constitutes a good practice session? Mm. That's a that's a question for everyone to consider. Yeah. So time time is just one factor. Mm -hmm. How you know how engaged is somebody when they're when they're training? You know how interested in, in what it is that they're trying to learn? Um, you know, are they adding in some variation to their practice? Mm -hmm. um, is it hard? You know, are they setting the the goal just beyond with our current skill level? You know, all of the sort of simple things from the from the literature. If you've got those elements in there, some variation, some difficulty, and there's interest and engagement in the learner. I think some of the deliberate practice research talks about forty minute windows is about ideal in terms of time scales. If you're practicing like that, yeah. uh, you know, I think we would expect to see gradual change and improvement, you yeah, know. So it's but just hitting balls, you know, you'll probably describe it you'll describe it better than me can when you talk about it's just like just conditioning, isn't it? Most people hitting golf balls at the driving range are just repeating the same thing over and over rather than actually breaking the pattern that they're in and thinking about how they're moving the golf club to, to solve the problem or is there even a problem that they're trying to solve? Yeah, for, in my personal experience, when I, when I started to, to change things or learn things, after three years of playing, uh, I uh, took in, taking lessons, uh, training six times a week. Uh, but after three years, the first time I met on a Fred Shoemaker. And then after videotaping me, he told me, Martin, I got 43,000 golfers on video. You're the number one slicer <laughs> by far. <laughs> What's that oil? <laughs> well, as in the biggest slicer. Yeah, biggest slicer. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And then, then it's good to be number one at something, isn't yeah, it? Number one at something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah still, still not, well, not too bad in that, but not still, far away from being the number one. I was <laughs> years ago doing a lot of things like that. And the first lesson that what's what's really uh, hitting me is that my focus from shot to shot, I always see, ah, oh, it was this one, and also this one, I've done also this one, and also that one, and also one. I wasn't focused on this one stupid thing, and just hitting 10 shots and keeping the focus where I want to have that uh -huh. uh, was my first thing I have to learn that I go into practice, uh, deliberate practice. And now when I'm sometimes here, you can you ask, come on here, we want to have a new thing. I even didn't hear you. <laughs> I'm just in here, I'm focused, just exploring whatever it is and getting in this deep focus thing. And, mm -hmm. and I've even, even I know there are no feelings in the brain, but it's, it's a different setting in my brain. I'm, I'm really focused now with that one thing. Yeah. And even if they're, ah, just we want to hit it, now there's 75 darts, yeah, yeah, but please let me up. I'm, <laughs> I'm in my exploring mm -hmm. things that mm -hmm. leads me then to maybe uh, doing yeah. the solution better in an hour or tomorrow and I cannot do that for too long no I think for me it's half an hour maximum 45 minutes yeah and then I need not only a small break then maybe yeah. minimum 15 and then can do maybe another one uh, but even being 15 minutes a day in this stage uh, in my experience is, is a great help to do that maybe yeah. better five times 15 minutes a week yeah um, and then I have to remember what was yesterday, what have I forgotten, where I was in, and coming back and forth. Yeah. Is that the strategy that could work? Definitely. I think, um, you know, small pockets of time, I mean, that would be my experience as well, especially if I'm trying to hit a certain shot, say, in the shot game, and I'm trying to solve the problem and I'm not quite delivering the club the way that I would want to, then it takes quite a lot of 
undistracted focus to be able to solve the problem as we were talking about today. So yeah, definitely. It's not it's just not a case of just volume isn't going to magically give you the... Yeah. There has to be a, a, a level of concentration and focus and on what it is that you're trying to achieve without a doubt. So yeah, I think I think you're definitely... Sounds like you're on the right track in terms of how you're trying to do it. Yeah, That's got, how I would do it as got well. Got some help from your coaches <laughs> <laughs> to get to that. It's not coming to me like that. I have to learn that in a hard way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Going a lot of different roads and sometimes... It. But yeah. that, that's also like the practice design you've done, for instance, for today with the golf nail, putting it this one, that one, then one hand, that, then doing that one without the ball, then doing that one, then put a ball there, then you design it and then steps by steps by steps, so what, what are your thoughts about that, what, what's necessary to go to there? Well, I think Stephen made an interesting comment yesterday about the purpose of a, of a coaching session or a practice session would not to hit would not to be to hit the ball better, but to heighten awareness primarily. Mm -hmm. so building that awareness of how we and the club are interacting and moving in relation to the problem we're trying to solve. Because if, if we can become more in tune with that, whatever the chat task I, I set, whether it was a golf nail here or exactly. there or whatever, the, 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 the players who are more in tune with the club and themselves have adaptability to solve a myriad of problems pretty quickly, sometimes instantaneously. But most people don't have that because that's not been the journey of their coaching and their practice. It's not been about awareness. It's always been about hitting the ball better. And that's understandable. That's what we want to do, isn't it? But And, and you made a great comment or point last year, Martin, when I asked you about your your musical expertise, and despite that expertise in playing the trombone, a new challenging piece of music would have to go through the same stages. Yeah. So the, the, the first week, your practice would not sound like the tune you would play in nine months' time. No. It, I might walk past the house thinking, what is he doing now? Is it nah, nah. What is he going to... But you know that. First it's, hitting it's, the right tune and then the rhythm and then starts getting flow and then mm -hmm. without uh, even needing the sheet and, and getting and, in more and more and more different stages through that until I can perform that on stage. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you are, a, are, a, are somebody like many musicians, all musicians I would suggest, who has a huge awareness of where their fingers are, where their breath is because that's what drives you to be able to play all the songs you already have in your repertoire. So that awareness is what you're applying to this new problem. But unfortunately, we are dealing with too many people in the sport who have no, in golfing terms, awareness of where they are and the club is in relation to the problem. So of course, it's, once that's achieved, it, it should be applicable to any shot they want. If they've got the time, the commitment, the passion to do it. But as long as they don't have, they can't learn to play the tune. So they'll yeah. never, they're just pressing the, the, the thing, I don't even know what they call them, I'm sorry, on your trombone. Yeah. This is a trombone, this is yeah, not a trombone. A trombone. <laughs> trombone. There are some trombones. This <laughs> trombone. Can we play to like, like a, like a trombone? I've never there are special to. versions of that too, but yeah. But you know, and, and I was... Or the but, strings or whatever, well, the strings, is, just putting but, it down and that one, and then it's not... But uh, trombone uh, to me is, I can see the string, and I know if I press that here and I do this, a noise will come out. You, yours is like a, a place in space, in time that it's not, you don't have a mark on it that says this is the note A. It's like you have to sense that, which is even more amazing. It's like a, a really complex tool to learn to use, isn't it? This is, yeah, this and then when, when you have the skills to do that, even just with my lips, I can adjust it, what I'm doing here to here and different things and with your breath and things like that and if you're having glowing and different things it's not always the same place it's, it's it's a bit different and always tuned like that and that that's a skill so but when i have to start learning it's a complete different story um and it, it's not possible to get this outcome addicted like golf because it's not possible mm -hmm. first i had just have to get a tone out of it yeah. Not, and, and then I just experiment, and it, 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 it took a month oh, yeah. uh, to, to get the first song. Wow. 
And, and, just, and, and then, then hitting it do like, and then the tone starts correct, that's it's the right volume, that's uh, leading into the next one and the next one, and then having like that, and just like a gossing starting here, then there, then there. Mm -hmm. That's getting a fluid thing, like a song. Um, and even here at, at this summit, I see a lot of also good players, whatever, we are, we are a complete mixture here of teachers. Um, the outcome is very addictive. Incredibly addictive. And the interesting thing about your passion for trombone is you can't access the outcome of the finished article of music today. You, no. And you know that, don't you? It's impossible. It's impossible. It's like, I'll just play that tune now. No, you have to go through this stage. And I think it's important for anyone listening that they understand if they could look at it from that perspective in their own lives, they'll be able to look at things in their own lives that this applies directly to but they have not learned X, Y, and Z in the way they expect us as coaches to help them learn X, Y, and Z by next Saturday. Because mm -hmm. you accept it's a six, eight month, and you're an expert in the field. So I think it's really important that people kind of get themselves or become aware of that, be realistic, and embark on this journey for, for life. Building that awareness and building that, that sense of what they're doing with the golf club and their body. And, and, and it, it's not about the competition and stuff. No. It's I, about the, 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 the developing of skill over the, the long term. And it should be an enjoyable experience, albeit it can be very frustrating. But Yeah, I, I fell in love with the process when I'm, when I'm in the training, not in the outcome. Yeah. And I have to learn that too. Even then, when you shank it, we know this horrible feeling in that one. But then that, no, I'm, 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 my decision is still be here, explore what happens, or just keep the training. I'm now here for training. Like, what does it feel like here? How can I apply the force mm -hmm. in that one? And then I can, can do that. And that's why I'm here. Um, and that's a different point of view. Of course, we want to maybe score better. It longer, <laughs> especially me. I like that um, getting getting into sting player and then exploring the, even the borders of the, and the where ends my possibilities today. Yeah. But, but but then seeing more what's what's mm -hmm. going tomorrow and the day after that. Yeah, and, and I suppose the other alternative is you just get some good sounding information. You know, you can go somewhere and it's just you're just given lots of like good stuff. You know, good information around things that you should be doing, but. You just end up going away with information rather than an understanding of how to go away and help yourself and learn better, you know. And that's where I, I was I didn't have that ability when I was hitting lots of golf balls. I was just repeating one thing rather than problem solving. So I think what we try to get across this week is more around, you know, could could everybody go away and just learn and develop on their own? Have they got the tools to do that? Yeah. Because then there's a lot of possibilities. Yeah. When, when you can access that, rather than just going away and trying to remember information. Yeah. That's, not, that's not really conducive to learning stuff in the long term. I can read a lot of, well, not, not, not a lot of trombone books, but about rhythm right. and things like yeah. that, but yeah. you cannot have uh, rhythm feel and the bit of that. You can read 50 yeah. books about that, yeah. but you can do nothing in, 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 in field. Yeah. And that, that's the truth that, that most of the people are struggling with that because we are information-based mm -hmm. society. Mm -hmm. uh, all this, even the little thing like the, the cameras and whatever, incredible multi-computers, search engines, chat GPT now, and all that one, artificial intelligence, but, but our intelligence, is, it, it, our brain has to train, mm -hmm. repeat, going through different changes, and then we own new strategies and problem solving. Yeah. And then we can start to perform uh, mm -hmm. better. And transfer it. So, so that, that's my personal decision to do it in that way. Yeah. And then the scores and whatever will come. It, it's, it's different. Uh, I, I know start when, when I go to the golf course, start getting more creative. For me, it's getting out on the golf course is more creativity now instead of surviving. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. I'm not losing all the times golf balls and having no idea what happens. Uh, things like that. Yeah, and sometimes, like, you know, information is everywhere, isn't it? So it's not like any information is not valuable. Definitely not saying that. Like, information, some information can drive that creativity. So, you know, we talked to, today about, for example, we want to launch our wedge shots at 
this height. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just a bit of information, isn't it? But that can then drive some exploration around, okay, there's there's a reference point, right? How do I now go and explore to try and bring about that outcome? So in, information, if, it, if you're using it to drive the exploration and the learning, it can be of, it can be of use. If it's just, I'm just going to use this and this is just going to magically make me better because I've got a lot of information. It just doesn't, yeah. it doesn't work that way. I, I love information. I read hundreds of books. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and even yeah. watching Me YouTube too. videos, whatever, what, all of that is. Yeah. It, it's great. Uh, but to, to get that helping me doing the shots better, I have to filter what maybe yeah. is for my practice design today, you yeah. think. And yeah. I think there's something like, I don't know if it's my translation is correct, a competence illusion. Yeah. When I read 100 books about the golf swing, I think yeah. I know something that I can do something. And mm -hmm. the second thing is not true. Yeah. I have right. information, then I have the, the big different part what, what, I, what really a skill is, what I really can do. That there's nothing to be said, I just And all so, these tips and things are on that pile, but the doing what I'm able to is on, on the other part of the uh, very, yeah. yeah. It's like golf. The brain. It's like golf's unusual. It's the only sport where there's more teachers than players. <laughs> <laughs> Soccer? <laughs> I think yeah. there are a lot of trainers. <laughs> and, <laughs> National team specialists. Yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> the yeah. field, of course. And sometimes everyone who watches YouTube is a, is almost a teacher. Yeah, they, they think of themselves as a teacher because they've just got information rather than yeah. their their jobs to play the game better, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, so, and when we conclude on that, what will be next? What will in the in the future? What have you a vision for? What will come next? What 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 do you want to do with with the golf community with the golf world? Do you want to change something, enhance something? What, what, what's, what's your mission? Well, I'm, I'm too old to worry about that. <laughs> so I'm handing that baton over to Stephen to carry. Um, and then I'm, I'm just on a selfish mission for my own game. Mm -hmm. uh, and hence the reason. I've got no reason to hit shots to the extent I do because I'm, I now wouldn't play in anything competitive. There's no competitive goal. And it's just for an, it's, it's the, the drive of trying to master this unmasterable, as, as Fred would say. Yeah. And knowing there's something deep down inside me knows that I can move myself in this club more effectively. Even though it was a lovely shot, deep down there's something still not where I want it to be and that drives me. And, and I'm, I'm certainly no expert player, um, but where I am now has been 20 years in the making. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit like, you know, the, these bands that appear um, selling millions of pounds or worth of records and people say, oh, oh, just an overnight success, but they've been a 10 year overnight success playing in yeah. all these little clubs and pubs and, and it, it, nobody realises that. So they just see what they see and think, oh God, they've just come out of nowhere, but they haven't. So golf games and swings and skills don't come out of nowhere. They don't come out of a no, book. Because no. we can read a book today and we've got, it's, it's that drive. And mm -hmm. So yeah, and I, I do love to share that with people, but I know what I've put in to get where I am. And it's not everybody can apply that to themselves because it's my life, it's my passion. People have got lives to lead out with us. So it's tempered by that. And yeah, and I'm at a stage where the younger coaches like Steve and those guys are, I'm hoping will remain committed to that, to skill acquisition, to helping people develop skill. But the realization is this is challenging. This is seriously challenging. And the biggest challenge is habit. Mm -hmm. It's conditioned. People are conditioned to move in a way they move and they're unaware of that. Therefore, everything they do is from that standpoint. Yeah. So if they're swinging over the top and they swing less over the top, they feel they're swinging from the inside. And then, but they're not. So then they swing less over the top and they think, well, they're now swinging a long way from the inside, but they're not. Because their experience and their awareness is not tying in with reality. And once it does, once that, I think, crossover happens, that to me is what allows people like Stephen to hit shots with such accuracy as we saw yesterday because his sense, his awareness, his feel for what's going on is so close to reality. 
that he can produce that, and tomorrow he can produce it again, whereas the found that lost it cycle that most of us go through is based on low awareness levels of club and body and anxiety and state and stuff like that. So I'm hoping these guys will continue with that journey and, and heighten the awareness and fight the corner because I know there's a change of foot, but I would say the, the tide is still against us, considerably against us. So we're trying to fight, swim against, swim upstream, we're, we're fighting the current. But I think people just have to ask after 10 or 15 or 20 years in the game, are you more skillful than you were? And I think sadly most people will say no. Mm -hmm. It might be worse than it was. Mm -hmm. And that can't happen in trombone playing. Mm -hmm. Can't. You'll know in 10 years' time far more tunes than you know if you're committed to learning a new tune. But the story goes from people who come to me and say, I've been playing for 20 years and you know, I'm worse. Incredibly gifted golfers that have played at the highest level who now can't play it. It's a very unique scenario, that, isn't it? You wouldn't get that in other endeavours, I don't think. Mm. That's what I'm hoping these guys. So I'm handing the baton over, and so it's got nothing to do with me from now on. I'm taking the responsibility. And handing it to, to, it's up to you and him. <laughs> you need to you need to drive this industry. Out. He'll not stop doing these uh, workshops. He'll be doing them for a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. There we go. Yeah. And what's, what's your business? Uh, for the future, well, uh, I'm, I'm lucky enough to coach some, as I mentioned earlier, some squads. You know, I'm coaching the England National Boys Squad, um, county men's squad. You know, I'm just committed to helping players playing better. That's the most important thing for me. Um, no more kind of grand plans other than that. I think I'd, I'd like to have time to do a, a, some more research as well. I really enjoyed the research aspect of the last 10, 11 years. Yeah. So I'd like to do some research in areas that haven't really been looked at. So like, for example, I'm really interested in decision making in elite level golf. Mm -hmm. You know, how do elite level players mm -hmm. make decisions in tournaments? Yeah. Um, and is that a defining factor in one factor between really good players and less good players mm -hmm. is the, the way they make decisions. I don't think there's much research in, in that. Um, so, yeah, so interested in, in doing that and doing more of the workshops that we do. Just mm -hmm. both really passionate about the message and doing more of these further afield, I think, would be what we're very interested in as well. Coaching and I'm coaches. going to start a YouTube channel as well. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I'll leave that to you, Martin. You're much better at that than, than us. Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're always putting things together and in this setting we are, we are learning from each other. Even if you are doing the workshop and setting that up, but everyone contributes mm, um, to that. Yeah. Um, that's a different setting and uh, also experiencing that is, is very, very worth of it. Yeah, you always hear things in these days that we do, you know, little insights, often from Ken, or even from just from, you know, well, the delegates, there's a lot of experience in the room, a lot of experienced coaches. You always hear things that you haven't thought about or perspectives, hearing things different ways that you, makes you think and reflect as well. So I get a huge personal benefit from doing these type of workshops. Mm. Um, selfishly, <laughs> you know, I get a lot of benefit myself. Yeah. And um, one of the more challenging Things is like you think against the tide. There's the big wave against us. I think you told that um, I make a decision not to argue against something like that. Instead of when when we have so many fields in life, it, it's whatever we're doing, the craftsmen um, and different things like other sports are learned. Maybe when that's a natural thing, even if the, the big bunch of community still is uh, information is the correct way to learn something and things like that, instead of really can apply a solution to something, mm -hmm. well, that speaks for itself. Because when, when you really step back and who is getting better, that are the players who have, are able to hit another shot next year. Um, more variability in their, their, their game mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. not having to remember everything, just owning the strategies for the solution. That not means that it, 
each and every time it's perfect. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of, in this game, one degree of whatever, a few millimeters, making a huge difference. And the solution like lies in this one and that one. We have yeah. hundreds of different things outside. So that perfect swing can only work on one or two shots around. Mm -hmm. what, what do we do with the other 60, 70, 80, 100, 120, whatever shots? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but getting in love with the game is just hitting the ball and feeling it coming from the club face. And look at 80, 90, 100 meters. That's incredible distance. And the people are going to, ah, oh, no, you, I should have to do this iron 130 meters. So who tells you that? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's an incredible thing that you're able to do that 30, 40, 50, 60 meters. And then the experts with, with what, what, what they can do in the field, the tour mm -hmm. players, it's incredible. Yeah, it's it's what, what, what kind of supercomputer and ability they have to coordinate at that forces and accelerations and speeds being that exact, that it's unhuman. It is. It's <laughs> like that, but it's astonishing. And getting um, in love with that, what, what we are doing with it, instead of always asking us, oh, I'm so bad, I'm not this one, I'm not that one. No, mm -hmm. just look, look the other way around, enhancing people. Yeah. I think that would be my personal mission, even in the fitting. Mm -hmm. So you work that, even if you're playing two years of golf, we do a fitting. It can benefit you really, really much, even in the beginning stage, and sometimes even more. Mm -hmm. um, at the beginning stages of fitting? Yeah, really. after two years fitting, yeah. it's an incredible thing. It can help them if they have a shaft and things like that, and the club mm -hmm. head that supports their body. And then they have a tool that can solve the problems yeah. a lot easier than putting 10, 15% away from coordination effort. They, they need yeah. that, and that makes the process easier. They're, they're struggling a lot in, in the first years, and then the idea after three years, five years, I have to be handicapped 18, 12, 10. Well, and then they're coming back, well, it's a long journey. Yeah. It's a long journey. No, it is a long journey. And it's okay. so much adventures on the golf course from hole to hole, sometimes shot to shot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like Very that. much so. Yeah. And I think as well, you know, if, if, if the coaches are you know, if the coach is walking that journey themselves and experiencing yeah. those, yeah. they're they've got more empathy and more understanding of when the player is in that. Yeah. Rather than just a dispenser of knowledge. It's like when you've experienced those you know, we've experienced lows in our journey of trying to get better and hit some dead ends. Yeah. And uh, I think that's important. I think you know, if you're looking at what are the things that are really important from a you know, if it's coaches watching this what are the most important things to develop as a coach? I would say for me, in my top three, would be to keep developing your own skills for a whole host of reasons, you know? And I think you're more able to help the person on their, their journey as well, without a doubt. That's what Fred Shoemaker told us. And what's a, the best coaches are always the best learners. Yeah, yeah. And never stop yeah. learning. Definitely. Yeah even in on the old game, and, and he's a role model for that. Yes. Each yeah. and every day. Yes. Yeah. And, and it, was Ken, it was Kendall, really, that drummed that idea into me a long time ago, 20 years ago, which I hadn't probably considered. I just left my game to the side. It's like, I'm not playing anymore. Let me just... But from that time, Kendall would always emphasize that, and that's had a, a big effect on my own thinking. That's what's kept me thinking about my own game over a period of time, and it's, it's fed into my, my coaching a lot. I would say it's just you know personal experience alongside you know knowledge. Yeah, my, my project was I call it my project 55 plus. I'm now 56. Yeah. <laughs> I started it last year, um, looking about how much <laughs> how much speed uh, you can, can I train? Yeah. Can I can I get? That of course I've done lifting weights when I was young, things like that. Everyone starts from a different starting point. I'm starting with 112. Uh, with the driver now, fastest drive this year, 121, 180, ball speed, 56, and I've never played professional. I'm an amateur in that one, and um, that's my new project, and learning things like that, how to apply force. And the day tomorrow will be very interesting for us. I read that on day three, it's also about power, <laughs> doing that one, applying that. Um, and of course, I have a full-time job, more than a full-time job, usually I have a family, I have different things. I've not. 
cannot take a few months off no, to, no. To, to start that. It has to fit in my schedule. Yeah. That's so, a great achievement. And, and, and yeah, whatever it is, the outcome is not important, but the process. Yes. And challenging me with, with a new, um, yeah, a new task. Yeah. How yeah. to do that? How to hit it along? Uh, that one. And, and bringing enough golf balls with me to the golf course. <laughs> <laughs> and is that and is that um, is that in w w the interest in increasing speed? Does that come from you working with long drivers and following their journey in some way, or is it purely just something you're interested in from your own point of view? Well, um, this was supposed to be it, your it always wasn't it? fascinates <laughs> me. Even in, in the start, when I started golf uh, 18 years ago, uh, I started with, with a two or three irons and having that one, and next week I bought a driver. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so then I hit it that and the first time going whatever 180, 200, whatever. So, wow. And there's the end of the range. And now let's try to hit it to there. Um, and it, it always fascinates me how we, just with our muscle power, mm -hmm. can we propel this kind of object that kind of distance and the feel and what it needs from the physical standpoint, mm -hmm. it's so much power. I'm measuring that with the force plates and think like how much power and force and acceleration is necessary and the, the chain of events that had to happen that it really comes there and even hit it. Mm. When I'm going full out, I quite often miss it completely, the ball. And that's, that's not the nice thing to the body. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, no, but even then, uh, get, getting in that one, I've, I've never get hurt. Um, but. but uh, it, it's a quite a nice experience um, to, to do that. I think it's, it's fascinating itself. And of course, uh, having quite a, a few long drivers, mm -hmm. um, including very successful in my studio, measuring what they are doing, what their bodies can do, and uh, just let's, let's see. And mm -hmm. even then, uh, you need a very good technique. That's number one. It has to be efficiency wins. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it's not about pure power. And yeah. That one has to apply in the correct direction and things like that. And yeah. then there are specific things you can do and train a lot. Right. Uh, and it takes very regular training. Training, yeah. And it's a journey, even mm. of a few months. But minimum, I think minimum three times a week, four times is best. Um, All right. Some additional well. things. But don't know what's in two years. No, but you do not. We do not. Oh, and we never own speed. Wow. Just just was eight days off an holiday. It took me ten days to get back after eight days. Yeah. And people think they own things like that. Yeah. So it has all to be to refine and things like that. But that's one of my missions. And nice things like that. Okay. Good luck with that. Good luck. Yeah, thank you. So I will thank you for the talk. Pleasure. Um, Pleasure. And to to uh, that's the golf world and the coaches world. There's some some very very maybe I would we would I think be more than happy if a few of them just rethinking their approach and thinking there's there's more than that and then the outcome of that one and how we can really develop people how can we help them to coach themselves to to getting better for them on uh, that one. Uh, I hope we will do a lot of seminars, summits, experiences together for the next decades. <laughs> uh, absolutely. And I think from our standpoint, um, given it's been 15 years, we would like to thank you for your support. It's been incredible. And it says a lot about you. So the 20 people that are here of the 10,000 golf pros who could be here. Yeah. Is that that's what you're saying? If if two or three people listening to this will just think maybe that would be success. Because yeah. two to three will become ten, will become fifty, will become a hundred. Yeah, and we have you have quite I think about thirty videos on your YouTube channel. Yeah, but like they were forced upon me by uh, COVID, and of course, not being a socialite or social media guy. I've never put another one on since, so I apologise to anyone who goes on to my, my YouTube <laughs> channel, but uh, happy to 
share anything if people want to yeah, contact but, but the me. ideas are timeless. Yeah, yeah. yeah it is. So well, that's not about that's if it's a new <laughs> video or five years or ten years old. <laughs> and and I, looked, I looked a lot younger when I was only three years ago. It's not it's tragic, <laughs> but there we go. <laughs> Do you really expect us to, to no. say thank you? Uh, <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you for Can we find some information about you on the internet, on YouTube, or somewhere? Um, there's probably a good chance you can. No, <laughs> um, I don't. I don't think I've got any videos on YouTube. And do um, you look at things? What you've written down or master things? Yeah. So uh, two of my papers are published, um, and they're available free, free to download online. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I can give you, uh, you know where to get those so people yeah, can go on Google and you should be able yeah, to find them no, quite just, just give me that and I'll put the link in the description. Yeah, yeah, mm. absolutely. You should be able to do that, no problem. Thank you. So, okay, Stephen. Thank you, Martin. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Thank Cheers. you.